Beyond the Clef is presented by Director's Choice. Welcome to Beyond the Clef SMSE 2018 on Saturday, and I am here with Michelle Hank. Thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Now, you were at Henry Middle School in Leander as a choir director yes. there, and then uh, you took six years off I did. Uh, to be a mom, and then now you are going to start up in a couple weeks here yes. <laughs> at uh, Willowwood Junior High. That's in Tomball. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So what was it like? So you, you you're telling me off camera, you went, you, the last time you were a choir director, you were a mom of a newborn baby. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then now you're going in as a mother of three. Scary? I am. <laughs> uh, a little terrifying. <laughs> Uh, but you know, I think it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be just great. We've got the childcare lined up, and cool. having a support system is right. is crucial. But right. um, I'm excited for the challenge. What did you I'm do? Really did you stay active in those six years? And... I, you know, I really did. Um, I came to. I still came to all the conventions because that was a great way to keep networking and then keeps up my skills. So I felt oh, like yeah. I was staying relevant with what was happening in music education and. Um, I was fortunate to be able to clinic and judge for UIL and do all of that. So it, That's just, great. it kept me keeps your kind skills. Of, yeah, it kept, in. yeah, it did, and it was um, it was a good outlet for when I was doing mom stuff most right. of the time. Right. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. Well, you wanted to talk today a little bit about. Um, just the classroom and some of the things that you experienced when you were at Henry and and uh, going into it and you did a great video for us about just some classroom little management mm -hmm. things let's expand a little bit on that okay. you talked about um, uh, like classroom management and, and discipline and communication can you talk a little bit about that well with regard to classroom management, the biggest thing that I, I think about first is procedures. Um, I want the procedures to be set up at the beginning of the year, and I run the kids through those procedures until they have it down, and I don't, I don't accept less than uh, perfect on the procedures, and we go over it, and we go over it, and we go over it until it becomes second nature for them. And then I found that once those procedures are really in place, things kind to start running themselves and the discipline problems become less and less because they know exactly what is expected of them from walking into the room getting their folder and going to their seat to what do I do if I need to sharpen my pencil or if I need to use the restroom um, I really I mean, liked any of those your uh, short little promo video you had mentioned a student area student oh yeah station. A student student center student center so, can you tell me more about that so what I would do is I would have um, a, a file usually something on the wall hanging file and I'd put all of the forms or letters home handouts that kind of thing that had been passed out so the kids need another copy they just go and get one they don't have to ask me for it then go and find it they need a pencil um, sharpener whatever it's there if they need tissue it's there um, turn in boxes they're there they're labeled with their class period on it so they everything is divided up for me um, my goal is to give them a way I, I found that it gives them some ownership in the room like okay I can do things for myself so I don't have to I don't have to ask permission to do every little tiny little thing um, and then they don't ask they don't ask me or interrupt me to get help with those things it, takes a lot of the pressure off me to have to do everything. It's just delegating all of that back out to the students. What about uh, how you mentioned kind of what they're doing in the classroom? What about discipline and what's your approach on that? Well, with discipline, I, I, try, I try to be very respectful in the method that I use for discipline. Um, the kids, sometimes they don't get modeled respect at home very much depending on your modeled respect from their from their parents from their family tell me more about that term that's interesting so i feel like my job for them is to model how i want them to treat me and to treat other people okay. in the room so when i approach discipline if there's a student that is not on task um, I, I tend to start with some sort of nonverbal. Um, i've used a stop sign in the back of my badge that i've just flash it to them they know that it, there's a problem they need to stop doing what they're doing but you don't have to say anything you're not calling anybody out you're not embarrassing anybody uh, and I find that they respond better to that standing close to their chair works really really well um, but any way that I can get their attention and redirect their focus back to what we're doing for class during rehearsal it it keeps the 
keeps the emotions out of it. Um, and then beyond, I mean, beyond that, private conversations are always better than public calling out for misbehaviors. Um, I do a lot of communication with parents, just keeping them involved, and I find that that helps a lot too. But um, I do try and model to them even in my discipline method that I respect them, but there are expectations and I respect them enough to have high expectations for them. It's always good, I think, I feel when I do make those phone calls uh, with the parent and it maybe was um, not a super positive conversation, you know, something their kid is doing, whatnot. Sometimes I will put a reminder in my calendar for like a week later or two weeks later to follow up with them, especially if that child is doing great because Absolutely. Uh, I was in a clinic with Robert um, Herrings, yes. uh, who you worked with, yes. yeah, and uh, Corey Graves uh, a couple days ago. And one thing that they said that I, this is one of my favorite tricks, and I love it, and it's so funny. If you just say you have a negative phone call with a mm-hmm. parent, then just pick another couple kids and do a positive phone call. Absolutely. And it's so funny uh, when you call up that parent and say, you know, hey, this is the band director, you know. And, you have a moment you're sure well I just wanted to tell you that your kid is doing a fantastic job they've been on task all week they've been playing really great and then they're like oh um they don't know what to say they don't know what to say because they're expecting like oh oh, no what'd you do now yeah I use that a lot too when I was teaching with Robert and um the same school as Robert and I remember one in particular that I called and I knew he was he had problems in his other classes a lot of times he front office frequent flyer and yeah. his mom just when I said it's choir director she seemed so down at first and then I said I just want to tell you how great he's doing in choir and she said I have never gotten a positive phone call ever from a teacher about my son and she was so thankful I just I mean it really helped and then he acted better in my class than he had been the entire year after yeah, that one because call. then they go home and get something positive positive. Exactly, and then, so yeah. they're like oh now I need to keep that up and, uh-huh yeah, and I think it made him feel sports. really good right. so talk to me about building those relationships with the students and particularly you have uh, inquire you know boys voices are changing yes. you have boys and girls you have mixed groups some not mixed groups um, I, both, yes. yes. I have, so, my I, classes are separated by by uh, gender voicing, and then um, we combine outside of class time for okay. mixed groups. So how do you build those relationships with those kids? And what's um, that dynamic like having a class of all girls and then all boys? I don't get that experience very often. <laughs> it was very different. Boys' classes are a lot louder. There's a lot more movement. Um, girls' classes, they, they can be you know silly and but most of the time they like to sit up tall and they have their pencils and and they are ready to sing Um, and boys boys classes are fun and energetic and a little crazy and they still make great music but um, it's just it it feels different having having boys and girls for my own children I'm seeing how early that starts that they're so different But uh, as far as building relationships, I what I think is most important is being authentic. If you kids are kind of like dogs, they can sense when something is not really right. So if you're not being yourself with them, if you're being trite or you know putting on airs, they're they're going to be able to tell right. that. So don't don't try and be somebody that you're not. Just I mean genuinely say, what's up with you? How's how are things going? What are you involved in? Or, you know, I mean, you find out, like for sports, for example, I know some people really like to, I, I'm a mom of three now, I won't be able to go to every football game. But what I would do with my kids before, um, when I was at Henry, is we did the Bleacher Report. And at, um, see, games were on Tuesdays maybe, so on Wednesday I would choose one student from each team and they would give me a 60 second Bleacher Report. Oh, that's So fun. they would tell me the, you know, what the plays were right. that, they that were so really great. And that. they point out other kids that's in the cool. choir class that have done something. Um, the girls like doing that too, but it really, really resonated with the boys. So that's one thing that I do. I, ask I always a lot like of to questions. do that too with the kids. That maybe I, I had a private conversation with a kid, and um, it I had to make sure that they knew that I was not happy with them. And so they left that 
I, I hope when they leave that conversation, they feel bad about it because that's a good thing. That means that they care, right? So sure. they're not gonna they're gonna be sad about that, and they go out of the room and whatnot. So I always try to make it a point, um, either later that day or the next morning or at lunch, to try to go in that area and look for that kid. And not even talk about that and just like talk about something else exactly. and be like, hey, you want to practice? All right, well, good luck. And, yeah. you know, who's, you Letting know. them know that the relationship hasn't changed just because something right. Right. maybe a little right. sad or negative occurred at one point. But yeah, it's so funny that, uh, you know, sometimes I'll turn on that teacher voice, if, especially if it's a large group and uh-huh. I need them, you know, and then some of the kids are like, well, you were really bad. I'm like, it's okay. It's just a switch. <laughs> <laughs> I can turn it on and turn it off. It's fine. <laughs> So something that we don't necessarily deal with in the band world, but I'm sure you deal with uh, more in the choir world, is boys changing voices. But you also mentioned that you have, you know, an energetic group of all boys class, you know, and and how do you uh, deal with, first of all, the uh, changing of the voices and what's your approach to that? And then uh, I'd like to talk about how you go about tempering that energetic class. Sure, okay. Um, so with the boys changing voices, we actually make it mo- more of a group activity. Uh, the students get voiced periodically throughout the year. We write at the beginning of the year and we establish where they are in their voice change. There's a chart that I hand them and it's got little, um, a little description of all of the different uh, phases in the boys' voice change process. And so I test their range and they get to mark it on the staff and they compare it and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm mid-voice 2A. And they get, and then we talk about what that means and they can say, look, these are the notes that you're able to sing right now. And we talk about when they have breaks in their voice and they can't, they can sing notes here and they can sing notes here, but maybe they don't have any right here in the middle. Um, and we, I just make sure that they understand that this is, this is a process and it's, uh, it's temporary, that they're not always going to have breaks in that spot in their voice. My, my goal is to normalize the voice change as much as possible right. so that they feel comfortable with it. Um, I related... ever get, this might be an ignorant band guy question, but do they ever get sad when they have to change parts or change voicing and because they were kind of wanting to do that? Some Sometimes, but we, we try really hard to celebrate every little change, like hey, you can sing a new note today. That's super awesome. And, I mean, they, they cheer for each other. Cool. It's uh, We send it home so they can share it with their parents. And, I mean, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Once they start getting over this fear of my voice is changing and I don't know what's happening, and they go, okay, well, this is what it's doing today, and tomorrow it might do something else. Um, once that fear goes away, they start to step out of their shell a little bit with the the singing they're not they're not afraid to participate as much anymore Um, and that helps with the the discipline the classroom management the focus of the rehearsal because if they feel comfortable uh, in where their voice is then they they're ready their minds are ready to say okay I'm gonna try this Um, and that's what I push like it may not happen today and that's okay you may only be able to sing these three notes today but sing those three notes the best that you can. And don't worry about the rest, because it's going to change. So how do you plan your rehearsals? How do you plan lessons for the year or for the month? And what's your approach to that? Uh, well, I set short and long-term goals for myself and for my students. But um, when I think about lesson planning, I like to be very specific. This is a personal preference for me. It may not work for, for other people. Some people like a more broad guideline, but I like to know kind of a step-by-step of what I'm going to do each day. Um, what I present to the students on either a PowerPoint or on the board is um, is a much much abbreviated version. This is our agenda. I, I think it helps them to be able to see what our goals are for the day. Um, and, and when then, have you planned that agenda out? Did you plan that the day before or the week before? Or? I usually do it a week at a time, but again, I have long-term goals okay. related like to check, our check marks. or to our performance. You know, we need to be at this place on the music by this point because our performance is on this date. And then um, the the concepts that I'm that I'm wanting to teach throughout the year. You know, I I want to have. Um, certain rhythmic and melodic elements in place um, in say the first marking period while I choose music that's going to help me teach those things and I use the music as my resource um, with supplements for you know rhythm readers and sight reading books and that sort of thing but as much as possible I actually use the repertoire 
to to teach those individual concepts. Right, to guide the music. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for coming on our program. I appreciate You're it. You're such thank a fantastic uh, person to get to know, and uh, thanks for doing all the mm-hmm. side video for us and everything. And uh, I've learned a lot, and I'm going to take a lot of this back home to my program. Awesome. Thank so, you so much. Thanks for being here, and uh, thank you for joining us on Beyond the Clef. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Beyond the Clef. For more great content, subscribe on our website at beyondthecleft.com and be sure to follow us on YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Facebook.